I see. David, I, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed that we haven't crossed paths before. I've been looking forward to speaking to you. I want to comment before we start, though, on on how organized and uh, your your materials are in in back of you versus <laughs> this. You know, it's it's a comment about how we, how different we are, uh, but we are interested in the same topics. And I remember when I first got started uh, reading about UFOs, reading about this particular incident, the Farmington Armada. And wondering why it wasn't a bigger deal. You've uh, you've been digging into it, um, a, a much under investigated case. Why do you suppose it's been overlooked for so long? Well, I think George, uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind is the time period in question. This was just three years after Kenneth Arnold's famous sighting, three years after Roswell, and in 1950, here in the United States, we really didn't have an organized body investigating UFOs. Uh, when you look at APRO, for example, they weren't formed until 52, two years after the event. Uh, certainly NICAP was formed later in 1957. And even the smaller organization, which was extremely active in the 50s, uh, CSI New York, uh, they weren't formed until 1954. So I think some of those organizations tried to maybe backtrack and look at this case, but without tools such as the internet that we have obviously today and FOIA requests and things of that nature, it just basically was left virtually uh, un uninvestigated, underappreciated. Really, the only person to truly investigate this case, and I always love to give him credit where credit's due, is Dr. James McDonald. In 1968, uh, circa 1968, he started investigating a lot of these historic cases, and Farmington was one of those. And in fact, I even went to the University of Arizona as part of my research to collect his notes. And in fact, he even had audio recordings from that time period, George. Set the stage, New Mexico. We know about what was going on on Roswell, you know, the 509, things of that sort. But there's a lot of uh, interesting activity in New Mexico, human activity that some uh, visitor might be interested in. Absolutely. Again, going back to March 1950, what was one of the most prominent projects going on specifically in New Mexico? The development of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, much of that work being done at Los Alamos National Laboratories, which is just about 120 miles by air from Farmington. So we have to, to your point, provide that historical context for what was going on at the time, in addition to any number of military uh, development work uh, being done at, at, say, White Sands in the southern portion of the state. And for those that aren't familiar with Farmington, I think it's important to uh, kind of give you the location. This is right up near the Four Corners region in the far northwest corner of the state of New Mexico, extremely rural. And primarily, uh, the business then, as well as now, is primarily uh, petroleum, natural gas, oil, that type of thing. So it's uh, primarily that business that has helped fuel that uh, community for many, many decades. But uh, I don't think anybody knew of Farmington, New Mexico prior to this event. Certainly, it splashed across the headlines, not only locally and regionally, but nationally. I have many of the, the original newspaper articles. In fact, this is the the one from the Farmington Daily Times, which I have here. And one of my fav favorite ones, which I have an original copy of, is the Las Vegas, New Mexico. I need to be very careful in saying that since I'm talking to you, George, in Nevada, is I love this headline, Spaceships Cause Sensation. Um, these were front page news stories at that time. And you know when we talk about the, these sightings, to your point, uh, we have to underscore the fact that this was two and a half to three days of broad daylight sightings of anywhere from single to dozens to quite literally hundreds of reports. And here's another article, covey of a hundred saucers sail over Farmington. So to your point, when you're looking for a good UFO case, what's the measure as far as that goes? One object, a dozen objects or hundreds of objects. And what's interesting about this is the way the Air Force looked at this case. If in my research, I went to Air Force Project Blue Book files, Farmington, despite three days of broad daylight sightings of hundreds of disks, is not even listed in their monthly tally for the month of March 1950. However, if you're a tenacious researcher and you dig further, I found redacted Air Force Office of Special Investigation investigation forms specific to the Farmington incident. And in 2014, I filed a FOIA request to try to get the unredacted documents. And much to my surprise, I was able to secure those 
which also yielded additional witness names, which were redacted in the uh, formerly public documents that were out there. So the Air Force did not want these records to be easily found. Not easily found, no. And quite often, you know, especially in 1950, and again, uh, to provide some context, uh, Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, who is, of course, part of Project Blue Book in the 1950s, in his book, Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, still to me, one of the landmark books on the subject, uh, he referred to this time period, circa 1950, as the dark ages of, of UFO research. At that time, we have to understand that was under the Project Grudge umbrella, oh, yeah. where there was a huge anti-UFO bias within the Air Force prior to, uh, you know, Project Blue Book and after Project Sign, which was much more liberal in their approach towards the subject. So it was an interesting time period in that respect, which also to your, your earlier question, George, might yield to the fact that not a lot of information was out there because of that strong anti-UFO bias at the time. So tell the story, how this unfolded, the sightings. Absolutely. I, I actually have a timeline in front of me. Normally I can re relay this uh, from memory, but this is so convoluted and so complex if you'll afford me the opportunity, sure. I'll give you a quick rundown. Yeah. Uh, and this is, by the way, not just the Farmington incident. I gave a series of lectures across the country on this, and I call it Farmington, New Mexico and beyond, because what was typified in Farmington over these three days was actually part of a larger wave of UFO sightings, well documented, stretching from Colorado down into Mexico, even down into South America. I have original Latin American newspapers describing saucer sightings during this three-day period. So I think that's very important. Uh, but just real quick, I'm going to give you a brief run through. In Tucumcari, New Mexico, which is on the opposite end of the state, on the far east end, uh, we have a flyover of a solitary object that was documented in, in the Tucumcari Daily Times. It was described as a saucer and they could tell it was a saucer because of the way it tipped and moved. They could appreciate it from different vantage points, which is interesting because that echoes other reports that we heard from Farmington. Uh, that was at 9.15 on Friday, uh, March, or I'm sorry, Thursday, uh, March 17th. And then we have uh, 10.15 a.m. in Farmington, five to nine saucers observed directly over Main Street. Uh, departed to the northeast and were reported 45 minutes later to the west of town by other witnesses. 1030, hundreds, that's a quote from the newspaper, of objects seen west of town from the Farmington Daily Times. 1030, a red object was observed and two revolving disks seen having a tussle in the sky. We're going to come back to that red object, George, because that is an extremely important aspect to this narrative. Uh, then we have uh, 1030, another portion of the sky, Revolving disks swooping and swerving and turning like a top were reported by witnesses. And then at 1035, three objects staged a dogfight in the sky. Again, a direct quote from the newspaper where these things seem to be interacting with one another. Uh, 11 o'clock, we had a sighting of a solitary saucer shaped object that circled town, uh, came from the southwest, departed to the northeast with a sudden burst of speed. 11 o'clock, two metallic UFOs seen a smaller UFO moving very fast south to north and a larger one was seen stationary. So these weren't objects blowing in the wind. One was stationary while the other one was moving. 1115 to 1130, swarm of hundreds of objects observed. Red object is seen again and reported by witnesses. These departed to the northeast with a sudden burst of speed. Two o'clock, now we're into the afternoon, silvery object shaped like a rectangle with rounded ends was seen moving in a westerly direction. At three o'clock, fleet of hundreds, again, direct quote from the newspaper, flying in formation from the Northeast heading to the Southwest. Uh, at that same time, I was able to find in my research, based on uh, Albuquerque newspapers, there was a sighting also corroborated in Project Grudge Files, uh, three tech sergeants and an Air Force captain standing on the tarmac at Kirtland Air Force Base at three o'clock saw three objects moving off to the Northeast over the Sandia Mountains. It was significant enough that they officially reported it to Project Grudge. Uh, and then later in the afternoon, there's no time actually listed in the newspaper, over Las Vegas, New Mexi Mexico, a flyover of multiple unidentified aerial objects was seen. Uh, and then in Tucumcari, again, on the east end of the state, we have a flyover of multiple objects with a red leader being uh, observed as well. And that's one of the consistent themes is this red object 
that was different from the others. The other ones were described as silver or gray, moving in a formation, not a V formation, I might add. Uh, all the witnesses were extremely adamant because many were uh, former World War II military veterans. They said they were moving in a formation, but not an echelon formation like we would do with jet aircraft. And so I think that was an interesting distinction that they point out. But these objects would all move together and this red object would often be seen as the leader of the object. Um, in my investigation, I was able to track down two living witnesses to this incident back in 2014 and 2015. One is mentioned in the original Farmington Daily newspaper right here. Wow. His name, Mr. Marlowe Webb. I am happy to say he's now in his mid 90s, still very healthy, mind sharp as attack. He is a World War II veteran. He was actually the mayor of Farmington in the 70s, was a bank president and a private pilot for decades. So this man has a lot of great background as far as being uh, an observer, uh, looking at something in the air. He was working at the Perry Smoke Chevrolet garage on Main Street the first day on uh, the 16th, March 16th. And he was interviewed by Air Force Office of Special Investigators about two or three weeks after the event. But he was working in the parts department, as he told me. And he noticed as he's looking out the window, all these people looking up and pointing. Well, curiosity got the best of him and he decided to go out and see you know, what they're looking at. And he goes, I went out and he said, I looked up and he goes, I saw a formation of something. He's not a UFO believer. He's not anti-UFO. He simply says, I saw a group of objects. They did not appear to be planes. I can't say they were flying saucers, but they were objects of some you know, unknown description that were moving together. And he lost sight of them as they moved behind a cluster of trees. That's actually in a historic photo I have of the garage that's no longer there. And um, he still attests to that after all these years. And then another witness I tracked down lived 16 miles to the northeast in Aztec, New Mexico. He was actually a third grader attending uh, grade school, elementary school in Aztec. And he relays that over that two to three day period during recess, they would look up and see these formations of objects, which he described, George, as looking like double six dominoes lined up across the sky. It almost looked like a quilt pattern of these white dots that would be flying overhead in broad daylight. And so just a significant series of sightings, to your point, we have hundreds, if not thousands of witnesses, not just in Farmington, not just in Aztec, not just in New Mexico, but in San Antonio, Dallas, and even down in New Mexico City. These were well documented at the time in newspapers. Anyone take photos or film? There's a there's a purported photo that has circulated for many years. And I'm glad you bring this up because I always like to uh, provide some clarity to this aspect of the story. In fact, I have off camera here an original copy from 1950. Uh, it shows a V formation of circular objects. And it appears it was a photograph taken from someone on the ground looking straight up because you see this V formation of objects and clouds behind. Now, over the years, some researchers have tied it to Farmington, New Mexico. In my research, though, I've been able to obtain an original news copy from uh, London Times, huh. which uh, indicated that because I have the original news teletype also glued to the back, that it was originally published in a small publication that only existed for three years called the Teenage Times out of Dublin, Ireland. And <laughs> As it, there's many different attributions to this photograph as far as where it was taken, when it was taken. However, the first media coverage, ironically enough, occurred in March 1950, the same month and year as the Farmington incident. But all my research points to the fact it was a European photo. And to provide some additional clarity, all weather accounts and in UFO uh, uh, references from later in the mid 50s, where there were some vague allusions to this case, they described that the, the skies over Farmington were clear with a slight scattering of cirrus clouds. In the famous photograph that has often been falsely attributed to Farmington, you see cumulus clouds in the background. So obviously it doesn't fit the location and the time. What was the buzz in town? I, I, did people think that's an alien invasion or, or did they just say, oh, that's really kind of interesting and then go about their business or what? You know, to be honest, when you read the original newspaper accounts, the and I, I have to say this because quite often the skeptics will attack people that they've never met or that they don't know and say, well, these are a bunch of wide eyed UFO believers. 
when you read the eyewitness testimony, George, these people uh, are extremely grounded. They're simply saying they saw something they couldn't readily identify. They weren't saying it was an invasion from outer space. They were very pragmatic in their reporting, simply trying to describe what they saw without trying to attribute some meaning behind it. Um, I do believe many people thought that these were not uh, made in the USA just based on the radical flight characteristics that they were seeing these objects exhibiting. Uh, you know, many of whom, as I mentioned, were World War II veterans uh, from the Army and from the Navy. And so, you know, many of them were used to seeing aircraft, whether it was fighters or bombers. And these objects, especially the Red Leader, didn't conform to any traditional aerodynamic uh, shape that they were familiar with at the time. I mean, it sounds like, as you describe it, the most spectacular UFO sighting uh, ever uh, over one place. And um, there's nothing else that compares to it, is there? I don't really think so. You know, in, mo in the modern era, and it's funny you bring that up. I was thinking about this right before we started uh, the interview. Uh, really, the only, I think, corollary we have in, in the modern age would be the, the Phoenix Lights incident, right. as far as uh, not only the sighting itself, the number of witnesses, but how the media kind of, you know, had their attention focused on it. Uh, but what's interesting about this, and, and, you know, George, I always like to point this out. Many people on social media will sometimes make little snide comments. I know that's a shock uh, <laughs> that. Well, why do you investigate these old cases? It happened back in 1950. One of the reasons I like to point out investigating these old cases are extremely interesting is, George, let's say that a similar incident like this occurred last week. Can you and I sit here with certainty and say that it's not something military that they're testing? We can look back through the lens of history to these cases from the 60s and the 50s with a fair degree of certainty, what quote unquote state of the art technology was. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. And so when we see something like this of this scale and we know what they were testing at the time, because most of this has now been declassified from that era, we can look at this and say, this is highly anomalous. We can't say it's extraterrestrial. I'm not gonna go that far, but it's highly anomalous. And I might add the official Air Force explanation, which was really put forth by uh, Donald Menzel with Harvard, who was, of course, a huge debunker at the time, he attributed this to a Skyhook Navy balloon that was launched at White Sands that ascended up into a high altitude, eventually drifted over Farmington, and it ruptured due to pressure and temperature, etc. And what people saw uh, and by the way, in his explanation, he only references Friday, March 17th. And there's a reason I'm going to come to that. He described what people saw that they thought were saucers were simple bits of plastic from the ruptured skyhook balloon. Well, I have a number of issues with that, as any logical semi-educated person, I think, would. He doesn't touch on the fact that this was cited over three days. He only alludes to March 17th. And George, the reason he alluded to March 17th is because it helped fit a narrative at the time that the Air Force was really putting forth, namely March 17th, gee, St. Patrick's Day. People oh. were celebrating St. Celebrating Patrick's Day. They got inebriated. They went out and they saw flying saucers. So it was a great explanation to just dismiss this entire affair. Dr. James McDonald, in his investigative notes, which I have copies of from the University of Arizona, tracked down a gentleman. He only gives the last name in his handwritten notes. He tracked down a gentleman by the name of Dembrowski with Office of Naval Research. This, again, was in the late 60s. Dembrowski went back and looked at all Skyhook Naval balloon launches. They didn't have any within two to three weeks of the Farmington incident. And I believe the last one was launched in Minnesota and terminated somewhere over Michigan. So McDonald completely thoroughly debunked that explanation, in my opinion. You know, you look at the uh, 69 years of UFO history since Farmington, and UFOs are generally elusive, evasive. They camouflage themselves. They hide. They make it hard to document. This is a daytime, three days of daytime sightings seen by hundreds or thousands of witnesses. It sounds like a display, like they wanted to be seen. I, I'm sure you've thought about it. What were they doing? Was it making a statement? And why Farmington? Exactly. No, I wrestle with that question, George, because I have no doubt this incident occurred when you have this much eyewitness testimony. And, and by the way, contemporaneous documentation, we're not looking back on something that someone just simply made a reference to, as we often have in UFO lore, people just making up stories saying, oh, 50 years ago, I saw this. We have contemporaneous reports from Project Blue Book, 
from all the newspapers across the country documenting this at the time. Um, and I do wrestle with that. Why Farmington and why is this so different from many of the other UFO reports we have? Now, I do want to mention that about five years ago, I went to Maxwell Air Force Base with my friend Scott and Suzanne Ramsey, who investigated the Aztec New Mexico crash that occurred, uh, ironically, almost two years ago to the day to this incident. And I was trying to find radar data and I was able to find not radar data, but I did confirm that there was a top secret radar installation in El Vado, New Mexico. And the information from Maxwell Air Force Base showed that the, the radar coverage, if you will, did cover Farmington. So it's quite possible that these were picked up on radar. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to track down any of those radar records from that time period. But I just want to mention that, that it probably goes beyond just eyewitness sightings. If this many objects were seen, it's quite possible they could have been picked up on crude radar at that time. Can I get your thumbnail explanation of uh, our take on Aztec, the alleged crash at Aztec? Yes, uh, I'll be honest with you. Since Frank Scully's book came out in 1950, uh, I think for the most part, it had been widely uh, really discredited, uh, you know, calling into question, uh, you know, Gebauer and Silas Newton, you know, two of the big proponents that, that launched that story. I have to say, and I'm extremely skeptical when it comes to UFO research, especially crash retrieval stories. Uh, spending time with Scott and Suzanne, getting to know them and talking about not only what's in their book, but things that they're getting ready to add to an upcoming edition, new information. Uh, I'm 50-50. Uh, whereas I was ready to just discount the entire thing. They bring up some, some uh, uh, inaccuracies, some inconsistencies that lend to the possibility that this may have actually occurred in addition to uh, other eyewitnesses and families they've tracked down. Uh, that have had some really interesting information to bring forth on that case. So I don't think we should arbitrarily believe it. I don't think we should arbitrarily discount it. So I'm, I'm kind of being a good researcher and just, you know, writing that fine line, if you will, between belief and disbelief. Uh, but I'm interested to see the, the additional information that they're going to have forthcoming. But at least the door was slammed on that case by ufology in general. Now it's kind of open a little bit. Absolutely. And, and you know, it, it's interesting, too, because there's so many crash stories, as you know, George. We've got Roswell. We have Aztec. We have Cape Girardeau, Missouri and any number. Kingman, Arizona, you know, and I've always had an issue at trying to be a logical researcher, assuming for the sake of argument, if we're dealing with a highly advanced technology, why do they seem to drop out of the air so readily? I have a hard time wrestling with that. And uh, if these things, just for uh, the sake of argument, going with the extraterrestrial hypothesis, if they have the technology to travel vast distances from another star system, they, they have difficulty operating within our own atmosphere. When we conquered that, you know, in the early years of aviation, uh, I, I just have a hard time. And I know people have said, well, there were radar systems that, you know, tended to wreak havoc with, with their flight systems. I, I have a hard time, you know, accepting that. So the general idea of crash discs, wrestling that or trying to comport that with highly advanced technology, I, I have a hard time with that. Um, let's talk triangles for a moment. Sure. As you're probably aware, there's a lot of buzz uh, about triangles. One particular triangle that is rumored to exist in a photo coming in and out of the water, um, yeah. uh, photographed or documented by the U.S. Navy. We don't know if that photo exists. But triangle forms have been reported for a long time. You wrote a book about it seven years ago, I think. Yes. Can you give me your thumbnail on, on triangles. I guess the difficulty would be ours or theirs because we have some, right? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, we believe we do. Uh, again, nothing conclusive by any means, but uh, I'll answer the last question first. Uh, I, I want to be very clear. I think that when people are seeing triangular objects in the sky, it is a mixed bag to your point. You know, it's very simple just to arbitrarily lump one explanation onto something, but life isn't that simple, right? It's shades of gray. And so I think some of the triangles people are seeing are in fact advanced uh, aircraft uh, by uh, various elements, defense contractors, Department of Defense. However, uh, in 2012, when I was collecting a lot of this information, I had been since a famous case I investigated back in 2000 in Southern Illinois, where a triangle was seen, um, I, I was collecting a lot of historical reports. And I would see comments being posted on the internet that, well, these triangles are new 
ergo, they must be military. And I'm looking at accounts from 1950, 1952, original newspapers, government documents that completely speak against that, where these things were being reported worldwide going back at least to the 1950s. And I've even found some accounts from Scientific American and Nature and uh, Magazine Journal where they're reporting triangular objects in the late 1800s that were being seen in the sky that could possibly be the same type of objects. But I found it interesting that even in the Blue Book files, they had triangular UFO reports. And some of those, George, and I always like to underscore this, uh, involved radar confirmation. It wasn't just simple eyewitness testimony we're relying on, but there was radar confirmation in conjunction with uh, not only ground-based, but airborne witnesses, uh, airborne radar, ground-based radar in many of these cases. So um, I just felt that I never wanted to write a book, never thought I would write a book, but I really felt compelled to set the record straight, to dismiss this myth that this, these are all new, therefore they must be military. But uh, again, back to my earlier argument, uh, you and I, unless we're involved in these classified programs, we, we can't sit here and, and categorically state that they, these cannot necessarily be military in origin. Um, and so I, I, I leave myself open to the possibility that some of the more modern accounts are. But again, going back to 1950, uh, Operation Mainbrace, uh, the largest NATO naval exercise since the conclusion of World War II, they had a sighting of a triangular UFO that flew over the Danish destroyer Willemose. And so that's just one example of many military accounts of these triangles. And in 57, the Danish Defense Intelligence Service had a wave of what they called, and this kind of echoes almost the headlines from Farmington, triangular spaceships is the term that they were using at the time. And uh, I even found a Reuters News Service article from uh, April 1958 in the course of my historical research over the village of Brohur in Denmark, a woman was interviewed who claimed she saw a dark silent, low altitude triangle hovering over the village. Now, we might not put much stock in that since it's a single eyewitness report, but the Reuters News Service article goes on to state, Reuters was able to confirm 20 other villagers attested to what the woman saw. And in addition to seeing this dark, silent triangle, they saw a number of horseshoe shaped objects flying out of the triangle, each emitting a bright light, which was very interesting. I'm going to have to check, check out your book again to read, get caught up on that. Did you, uh, did you check out NID's analysis of triangle cases? Absolutely, of course. Uh, in fact, NID's uh, investigated the case that I investigated for MUFON at the time, the Southern Illinois uh, UFO that was cited by multiple police officers uh, in and around uh, Millstadt and Lebanon, Illinois. And uh, yeah, I found that their, their, their research was uh, uh, very compelling. Uh, especially the correlation between triangles being sighted near military bases. Uh, the only thing that I'm always hesitant on is obviously, George, going back to Research 101, correlation does not necessarily mean causation. Right. Just because they're being seen in military bases doesn't mean they're originating from there. And in fact, one thing I like to point out with the January 5th case, this object flew within an estimated one to two miles of Scott Air Force Base. Of all the witnesses at the time and then in subsequent years that I've tracked down, no one has attested to seeing this object taking off from Scott Air Force Base or landing. And so I think that's an important point. And much like the uh, UFO nuke co uh, connection, yeah, just because these UFOs are being seen in nuclear installations doesn't mean that they're originating from there. So I think that there's uh, whatever these things are, whoever is operating these things, they're definitely showing an interest in military and technological development. Uh, one last question um, for this time, that is. Um, <laughs> Give me your general take on current events, the yeah. interest in Congress, the UAP task force being given the assignment of collecting all this data from reluctant agencies, agencies reluctant to cough it up. Where do you think that leads? Are you encouraged by these developments? And do we end up in a happy place once this, this period <laughs> ends? Because you know, you've know you seen it before where the public interest waxes and wanes, the pendulum Absolutely. swings. So Absolutely. Well, regardless of where it goes, I think that the successive revelations, starting with the New York Times article back in December 2017, and, and many re revelations since then on the part of the U.S. Navy, uh, I think it's a game-changing moment in UFOs and UFO research, or I should say UAP. I'm still old school, George. Yeah. I go with UFO. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
But it's a game changing moment simply because, you know, quite often people, uh, especially in the UFO community, talk about disclosure with a capital D. I've never been one to espouse that or promote that. But, you know, in the interest of being completely honest with you and your audience, I think we're seeing disclosure with a lowercase d in the sense that they are acknowledging there is a phenomenon. And that is a huge 180 from decades long denials going back to 47. And so I take that and run with it. Just the simple fact that we at least can have a conversation now where they're not denying the phenomenon. Now, as I like to say, though, this gets, gets us to the core question, which we should have been asking all along. And by we, I mean the, the government, the military, not just in the United States, but elsewhere. Let's get past the stupid academic question, are UFOs real? Yes, UFOs are real. People see things they can't readily identify. And there's ample evidence to suggest there is some objective reality to whatever this UFO subject is. But we're now past that. So we, because of their acknowledgement and acknowledging there is a phenomenon, we can now work together, hopefully collectively, in ans answering the question, what are UFOs? And so I think it's a game-changing moment in that regard. Now, conversely, I know there's a lot of hope, a lot of uh, anticipation with regard to the, the UAP task force and the report that's pending. Uh, I don't feel very confident that we within the civilian sector are going to see much with regard to that. And I say that based on government insiders that I've talked to, people I know that have worked within the, the intelligence world. And they have told me, temper your enthusiasm. Right. Uh, if you look uh, at what the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee is requesting, George, there is a lot of detail that they want. And I think Marco Rubio just recently announced that it probably won't meet the deadline, which is ironic because a month ago I was saying that. If you look at their request, I find it hard that these staffers are going to be able to collect that information, go through the declassification process to get it into a working declassified document, which was the last comment. If you recall, they requested a declassified report. I, I don't see how they can have a readable declassified report when you see what they're asking for. Uh, so chances are, I think, and I'm speculating, it's going to be a classified report and that we really won't see much in, in the civilian sector with regard to it. Well, I think we're on the same page on all that that you just said. Um, I find it to be an extraordinary time. Just the fact that that report is going to be written at all is a yep. significant uh, move forward. And George, might I add something to this? Uh, I've been doing a lot of local radio shows here in New Mexico, live radio, and we've had callers calling in. And I just want to share a story because this is literally going to be happening here real soon. I had a gentleman call in onto the show he is a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and he heard me talking about the UFO subject. He's heard the local media coverage over the last two to three years, and he is going to be coming to my home this Saturday to talk about UFOs. And he has a friend who was in charge of advanced weapon development for the Air Force, who is also retired. He is going to be talking to me, and he has stories he wants to talk about regarding UFOs from his period at the Air Force. And I was contacted about two months ago, month and a half ago, by another retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force from Nebraska. So the point I'm making is, regardless of where this goes, it has suddenly changed the, 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 the tenor of the conversation. And we have people like these lieutenant colonels uh, that are reaching out, that want to talk now because that, that stigma has been stripped away from the subject. And I'm sure, George, with your contacts, you've seen the same thing. So it, it, it's a sea change moment right now that we're seeing in ufology. I never thought I would see it. Never did. No, no, I, I, I can't believe that. And I really think back because I am a historian in the subject. I look back to Don Kehoe. I look back to the Lorenzans during APRO. I look back to Dr. James McDonald and even J. Allen Hynek. I wish they could be here now to see this, this change with the phenomenon and with the subject. David, thanks so much for your time. We'll do this again. And then Absolutely. you and I will talk about other possible uh, media opportunities. And gosh, great work. I'm, I'm a great admirer of your work. And uh, I hope we get a chance to interact again. I look forward to it, George. Thanks. Thanks.